This time on Paul Hubble, we're looking at immigration in the U.S. through two different lenses, neither of which gets much attention in the media. First, how the fairly recent slowdown in legal immigration is threatening many of Joe Biden's big jobs and economic growth programs. Why is this happening when polls show Americans are relatively open to more legal immigration? Second, how increasing immigration, both legal and illegal in this case, is one of the easiest ways to keep Social Security and Medicaid solvent. Why doesn't it seem to be on the table as Democrats and Republicans snipe at one another over proposed cuts to these programs? We're gonna look at both of those things. And finally, one of the oddest questions in fun fact history. Ooh, there's a tease, who thought this one up? Let's get to it. And hi everybody, welcome to Poll Hub. I'm J.D. Dapper. I'm Barbara Carvalho. And I'm Lee Marengoff. Uh, Joe Biden, as we've talked about on the show, uh, got a lot done in his first term. Uh, some uh, historians probably are, are going to rate him as one of the top presidents in terms of the amount he got done in the in his first two years. Uh, and, and a lot of that involved um, economic stuff, uh, jobs programs, the CHIPS Act for the, the tech part of the economy. And uh, a large part of it has also been about greening the economy. So there's been a lot of uh, programs to increase jobs uh, and increase uh, production and manufacturing and all that over the years. But a lot of what he did also had to do with addressing climate change uh, with these programs, trying to kill two birds with one stone. But there's a problem that is becoming more apparent as each year goes by, and that is that there aren't going to be enough workers to do this. These aren't short-term programs. These are programs that will roll out over many years, lots of billions, trillions of dollars spent over many, many years. There aren't enough workers. And um, so an article in Politico about this caught our attention uh, because one of the things this article talks about is that the solution to that is pretty obvious, and it's pretty much what America has been built on, which is legal immigration. Yet immigration is uh, half of what it was. Uh, Donald Trump cut it in about half during his administration. And Joe Biden hasn't really tried to bring it back. Those numbers are still uh, quite uh, low compared to the last 30 or 40 years of illegal immigration in, in the U.S., what is going on here, and and I wonder, is part of this the conflation of legal immigration and illegal immigration, uh, which has been a very potent issue for Republicans? What do you think? Yeah, and I think that's a really good point, uh, Jay. And I was going to also make it as well that what we're talking about here is legal immigration. Um, and I think that that has been a significant change over the over the last decade. And as you point out, this is what the United States has really been built on. Uh, immigrants coming um, from you know around around the world, and I think um, you know the the political rhetoric has been such that um, you know immigrants have really been you know painted with a with a very negative paintbrush here um, in terms of um, being uh, in, coming in illegally. Uh, causing being the the cause of the impotence for uh, many crimes, uh, changing you know American values, um, the the usual negativism about immigration, and uh, you know when we look at public opinion, most Americans are completely on board um, with legal in immigration. In fact, um, they are supportive of uh, dreamers, those uh, those immigrants who came over over the last couple of decades as children um, and have grown up in this country. They are very supportive of uh, legal immigration, of people who are all already here uh, bringing over uh, relatives, um, either you know children or other family members, um, those that have strong support. Um, and although it is an idea, it is an ideological and partisan issue, uh, you still see a good deal of support among many Republicans uh, for legal immigration. So it does kind of fly in the face of, um, you know, what exactly is, is going on here where we have such an anti-immigration rhetoric, uh, but yet such strong public opinion uh, for those kinds of uh, programs and opening up of borders. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, and you, you both have touched upon the conflation between illegal and legal immigration and how in certainly to add to that in today's electoral politics and our legislative politics, that 
difference can blur and politicians who uh, self-preservation is probably the main motivation for most of what they do uh don't want to take that risk <laughs> and it's sort of like even in like uh, the topic of gun control which we've talked about where the overwhelming number of americans want to see all kinds of things done in the area of gun control and we're not making significant progress i would make go back to immigration i would say let's not lay this all at donald trump's doorstep uh, uh clearly you know he started off by building a wall and mexico is going to pay for it and a lot of uh bad attention was clearly focused on things he was really doing in terms of families being separated and all those kinds of issues. But, you know, for a long time, America had an open immigration policy. Uh, and it wasn't until, you know, we sort of got through a lot of the European waves of immigration where a lot of our roots are. Uh, and, uh, you know, then, you know, sort of quotas were being put in and there was only, uh, you know, the percentage allowed in for, to match the percentage of people we already had uh, here, and then all kinds of things. So America has a checkered history, certainly, when it comes to accepting people from other places. And now we get to the point where it's really needed. And, you know, it's not just the policies of uh, the Biden administration, uh, but it's just, uh, you know, the economy, we have such low unemployment. Uh, and we need more people, uh, and America's not growing <laughs> quickly anymore. We're growing, in fact, the slowest rate, I guess, since the 1930s. Uh, so um, we have a population um, drain here that uh, that this uh, situation could, uh, you know, could rectify. This also uh, folds into what we've talked about, which is the uh, the changes in educational attainment among Americans, uh, especially among uh, men. You know, fewer boys or young, you know, teen men going to college than than women, and all of this, and then fewer STEM workers. So, thirty eight percent of America's construction workers are foreign born at this point. Twenty seven percent of our electrical engineers or engineers of you know in electronics are foreign born. And uh, according to the National Foundation for American Policy, almost three quarters of all full-time graduate students at U.S. universities pursuing electrical engineering, computer and IT degrees and manufacturing and industrial engineering are foreign born. So this isn't just a case, you know, there's always this rhetoric, I think, of uh, immigrants coming in, taking our taking our jobs. Uh, well, unemployment's at its lowest rate historically that it's been and, and, and it kind of continues at that rate. And uh, we desperately need workers, uh, in, especially in these higher tech uh, jobs. And Americans aren't getting the education to take those jobs. Uh, it just seems like th th all signs point to the same thing, which is decoupling legal and illegal immigration in the American mind. And nobody is trying to do that. I mean, yes, you can fault Biden and you can fault Trump. Yes, you can fault Democrats and Republicans. But it does seem like an opportunity, especially since the business community is very much pressing for increased legal immigration. It does seem like some people who are a little more level-headed in both parties might be able to find a way to decouple these two things. We, but I don't we know, need, that's probably wishful need, thinking. Yeah, but we need very much to become and to continue to be a player in the global economy and to roll up <laughs> our, the borders, roll up the, uh, our, our, you know, separate ourselves uh, in an isolationist way, it's not gonna function very well uh, in the current economy. It's certainly not gonna function very well going forward. Uh, we have to maintain, if we're gonna be a player economically and we're having some trouble in that regard, uh, we're gonna have to uh, change this policy. There's, uh, there's no other way around it. And the issue of uh, immigration reverberates through many, many issues. Uh, we, you know, we've tapped on a, a few here, education, um, Im immigration policy over all the dreamers, but also the most recent report from the Social Security Administration predicts that the Social Security Fund will stop being able to pay full amounts to retirees uh, in 2034. That is, if nothing changes. And what I find interesting is that um, immigration can actually help solve this problem. Uh, you know, we've looked at other uh, more domestic uh, solutions to Social Security, such as increasing the retirement age, 
uh, increasing the poll payroll tax or somehow means testing benefits. So, uh, you know, people who uh, earn enough or have a high enough uh, retirement will uh, kind of opt out or be pushed out of Social Security or have their benefits uh, minimized. But um, this issue of immigration can actually have a significant impact uh, on our Social Security system uh, as well. So how does how does this play out? We've got this huge generation about, you know, in the process of retiring, the baby boomers who we've talked about um, in the past. And and yet we also have this potential to solve uh, solve these problems uh, with immigration policy as well. Uh, where do you guys uh, where, how, where do you guys take this? Well, Lee, you're collecting Social Security. So why don't you talk about this first? <laughs> well, I love it. And uh, I, I guess people <laughs> in my age group uh, are also very satisfied with the program, but there's been so much that's changed in our country. And uh, some of the demographics sort of speak to this. Uh, in 1940, a long time ago, 42 workers for every one retiree. Now that ratio is three to one. And by 2050, it's going to become two to one. So that's what creates the pressure on the system. You know, this is not an entitlement, Social Security. This is something people paid into. Uh, so it's not like we're getting back <laughs> something for free. Uh, so I, I think that some of the talk about lumping politically, you know, things like Social Security into a bunch of criticisms about entitlement programs is really misguided. Um, but I think there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of. Uh, people power out there that the immigrants could provide, and that would uh, certainly uh, go a long way into addressing the the environmental green issues as well as the economy itself. One thing that uh, struck me about when we were looking at this is um, when Gallup has asked about a bunch of questions about uh, this and other government programs over the years, and one of the questions they ask is uh, issues and what you worry about. And Social Security, obviously, going insolvent is one of the issues. And again, this is 2034. It's a long way off. We're very bad at dealing with problems 10 years in the future. I think most people are. I don't think that's just an American thing. But when people are asked about this, Social Security is really far down the list. It's in the in the bottom quarter of the list of people they're really worried about. Uh, and I think that's part of the problem is that until it is at our doorstep and crushing and it's going to fall apart tomorrow, I, I don't know that there's a lot of political will to deal with it. Instead, it's really handy as a political cudgel. Biden has used it very effectively against the Republicans most recently. But I wonder, has this it's interesting because uh, immigration is one way to solve this problem. Obviously, you get more workers. They pay more into the program. All of us can retire with our full benefits. There are other ways to deal with this. But for a long time, we've talked about Social Security being the third rail of politics, because if you touch it, you get burned. Is immigration that? Are these the two third rails of politics <laughs> kind of now touching each other and shorting each other out? I don't yeah, know. Maybe well, that's too much of a metaphor. Well, well, also, well, also understand that when we when we look at a lot of these statistics, they are assuming uh, a couple things. One, that uh, the patterns that we've seen before are going to stay the same. So there is a there is an assumption in the Social Security numbers and Medicare numbers uh, that everything is going to pretty much progress as it has already progressed. And it's not surprising, as we have discussed many times, um, that things change when baby boomers change their, <laughs> their 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 status in life because of the fact that they were and are such a large generation. Now, that said, uh, you know, it's a problem, certainly, for Gen X, who's coming up behind them, and were kind of the afterthought, uh, because they were such a small group. But there are many, many uh, workers coming coming behind the baby boomers. So I also don't know to what degree this is a, this is a generational and somewhat short-term issue. Uh, that has been placed um, in, in front of um, both our politicians and Americans uh, that doesn't have a solution in the long term as well. Um, the, the other thing, too, is that um, it, it's, it's, you know, Americans, um, Social Security and Medicare completely changed life for senior citizens in this mm -hmm. country. Um, it was it's it's a dramatic change. Uh, poverty among the elderly, uh, lack of health care among the elder, elderly 
were incredibly significant problems before these two programs. Um, so I think the, the sense that um, this is something that can be taken away is, again, as Lee pointed out, I don't think not realistic because it's not an entitlement. It's something that working people have have paid into. But I think it's I think it's particularly interesting of how Joe Biden has really changed the discussion about the issues and turned this on the Republicans because of the fact that it is a very significant issue for uh, 63 percent of adults, 65 and older, they say that they are satisfied uh, with the with the program, obviously much more satisfied because most many of them will be already getting benefits uh, from these programs than the than their younger counterparts. Uh, and, and not only is it, it, it important, but it's something that they depend upon. And so uh, when we when we look at just the transition that we've been going through economically in this country, it's really, I think, still the third rail, Jay. Yes, uh, I mean, I when you when you use that example, Jay, uh, <laughs> that Barb now just mentioned. I mean, hi, I'm a politician. I like to address the problems of immigration and social security, and I'm out of here. <laughs> I mean, it's <laughs> like, uh, yeah. But here's, let me let me put one other thing onto onto this discussion, um, and I, and you uh, you guys have alluded to this, and I, I want to make sure people understand, you don't pay social security throughout the year if you make a lot of money. In fact, if you make $160,000, you stop paying Social Security for that year, which means at some point for people who are like millionaires, uh, if you make a million dollars on February 28th of the year, that's the end of the time you've put into Social Security for that year. So a lot of people wonder, you know, they, they don't really understand or are not aware that although that cap has been, you know, has gone up over time, uh, there's still a cap. And so that person, the millionaire, is going to pay about $10,000 uh, into Social Security. Without the cap, they'd pay like over $50,000. Uh, so in a sense, for people who are wealthy, they stop paying into the, into the fund. Um, they may not get a lot back as a result. And certainly, I think we should point out that it's very important, and I may have slightly overstated uh, the, um, the, the, that it's a major source of income, retirement income for people. But the point is, you don't get rich on Social Security, and you probably need other sources of income to really do well. But without it, you're going to have some big trouble. No, no, I, I don't think, think you overstated it, Lee. Um, Fifty-five percent of retirees said that Social Security is a major source of retirement income. I think you had said fifty-seven yeah, percent. Yeah. So it's it's you know it's still a majority of seniors who are seeing this sure. as sure. Uh, I was just looking a major ahead. Source of income. I was look, looking ahead for two years. So I was just uh, projecting nice. the numbers out. <laughs> but I do I do think with the boomers finishing entering retirement, which is going to happen fairly shortly, yeah. it does seem like this 2034 as as it is, you know, look, it's 11 years off. We don't deal, as I said, we don't really deal with problems very well. They're 11 years off. But I do think that in this case, the the boomers finishing their retirement and so many of the boomers being well into their retirement is going to be the kind of pressure that forces a solution here. And again, you know, the two third rails touching is a is a great metaphor, but it's also it's just where's the politician who stands up and says, this is the solution. I could solve both of these things in one mm -hmm. fell swoop. I mean, you just need a you know a great communicator. Well, not necessarily Ronald Reagan, but you need a great communicator, I think, to to pull that that yeah. that off. And I, I I think there's an opportunity. Anyway, you know, again, wishful thinking. <laughs> well, uh, wishful thinking is not going to lead us too well into our next fun fact. Uh, but this is, as you said in the top, uh, Jay. This is a fun fun fact indeed. So the question was asked. I said weird, well, actually. I said weird. weird? I okay. Well, I isn't this weird? So weird? I think this is weird. Okay, so it was asked by you. Do you mean another another case of pollsters up late at night? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. See, yeah, I think they got to get. Uh, we should uh, do a survey on whether how many pollsters are actually also insomniacs, because this suggests it. So the question by YouGov uh, was: Which of the following animals, if any, do you think you could beat in a fight if you were unarmed? And I guess that's an important distinction. 
So there was a whole list of animals. Well, uh, you've that... always said that, Lee, that hunting would be a lot less fun if the if the animals were ours. So I'm I'm glad they made that distinction. Yeah. Well, and also I was uh, I was watching some old reruns of uh, the the Smothers Brothers, and for those who go back to that point, uh, Pat Paulson was talking about this and said, "You never know." When you go down the road and you spot a moose and you need some kind of gun. Well, in this case, I don't think moose made the list, but people think they could, and I'm surprised by this, uh, people think they could go toe-to-toe with a rat. Uh, I don't know if that's a good metaphor. Uh, they could take out a house count. Goose is uh, also uh, uh, something well, people... I don't. I don't know if people have really come face to face with a with a goose. That that's uh, not that's not an easy task. Although I must say, in all these uh, choices, uh, Americans seem either more courageous or more foolish uh, than uh, a, a comparable group in uh, Great Britain who has asked the question. But then, when you get down to the bottom, I think there's not a big surprise here. Uh, the ones you don't want to meet in a dark alley are things like grizzly bears, elephants, lions, gorillas. I don't envision taking on a gorilla. Uh, crocodiles, not a lot of fun there. These are all uh, animals uh, who um, you would not like to uh, uh, go toe-to-toe with, as I said earlier. What do you guys think about all this? Well, that's always uh, that's always my joke, uh, you know, when when you ask if we can take on, you know, these kinds of things. And I'm like, well, I don't have to take on the alligator. I just have to run faster than you, Lee. So, uh, so <laughs> that, you that's, that's 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 my out. And I really wouldn't want to take on uh, most of most of uh, these these animals from medium sized dogs. Uh, large dogs, eagles, kangaroos, wolves. I mean, you mentioned some of the larger ones, Lee, but yeah, uh, uh, yeah, I would definitely be, uh, you know, out toothed, out, yes, out we, run, out, out hug. Uh, Jay, do you think are you part of the six percent of Americans who think they could take on a grizzly bear? No, those people are insane. If it's an elephant, <laughs> like it looks like it's seven or eight percent. We don't have the exact numbers because this is a chart, but like seven or eight percent of Americans think they could take on an elephant. In what world? <laughs> what are they going to hypnotize <sighs> the elephant? I mean, but again, this gets back to who thought up this question, and then yeah. who thought? And you know what would make it an especially interesting twist? Let's ask the British and the Americans and see if there's a difference. I mean, that is some. They were <laughs> up late and they had a bottle they were passing around. I think because this is crazy. But well, anyway. but in each, but in each instance, uh, Americans uh, certainly do uh, overestimate, as you pointed out, either their, well, their courage or their craziness. Yeah. Well, um, and here's to, the problem also. The, 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 the problem also is if you happen to beat up an elephant, and I'm not sure how you would be able to do that. We know they have a good memory, and that elephant would come back and get you. So, I mean, we, we, you know, there's a really compounded problem here that they did not ask as a follow-up question. They probably should have. Well, I mean, and I want to end with one thing. Uh, so rat is the one thing that both Brits and Americans think they could yeah. take on. Yeah. Uh, around 70% of both think, oh, yeah, I could beat a rat unarmed. Now, first, who are the 30% who don't think they could beat a rat? And I get, I think I know who they are. They're New Yorkers. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. That'll do it for Poll Hub this week. Poll Hub is produced by the Maris Poll at Maris College in Poughkeepsie, New York. Mary Griffith is our executive producer. Casey Schaff is our production supervisor. The Poll Hub team includes Athen Hollis and Will Promisel. If you enjoy Poll Hub, please consider leaving a review. Positive reviews help other listeners like you find us. If you'd like to learn more about polling and survey science, check out the Marist Poll Academy, our free online learning portal accessible from our website. If you have questions for us, tweet them directly to at Marist Poll. Remember, you can always tell your smart speaker to play Poll Hub. And with any luck, it will cooperate. Finally, wherever you listen to Poll Hub, there is a subscribe button. Click it and the latest episode will be ready for you in your podcasting app as soon as it's released. We'll, we'll see, see you next time. time. Rats